The Nose by Nikolai Gogol On the 25th day of March, an extraordinarily strange incident occurred in Petersburg. The barber, Ivan Yakovlevich, who lives on Vozhnezensky Prospect, woke up quite early and sensed the smell of hot bread. Raising himself a little in bed, he saw that his wife, quite a respectable lady, who very much liked her cup of coffee, was taking just baked loaves from the oven. Oh, today, Preskovia Osipovna, I will not have coffee, said Ivan Yakovlevich, but instead I'd like to have some hot bread with onion. That is, Ivan Yakovlevich would have liked the one and the other, but he knew that it was utterly impossible to ask for two things at the same time, for Preskovia Osipovna very much disliked such whims. Let the fool eat bread so much the better for me, the wife thought to herself. There'll be an extra portion of coffee left. And she threw a loaf of bread on the table. And for the sake of propriety, Ivan Yakovlevich put his tailcoat on over his undershirt and, settling at the table, poured out some salt, prepared two onions, took a knife in his hands, and, assuming a significant air, began cutting the bread. Having cut the loaf in two, he looked into the middle and, to his surprise, saw something white. Ivan Yakovlevich poked cautiously with his knife and felt with his finger. Firm, he said to himself, what could it be? He stuck in his fingers and pulled out a nose. Ivan Yakovlevich began rubbing his eyes and feeling it. A nose, precisely a nose. And what's more, it seemed like a familiar one. Terror showed on Ivan Yakovlevich's face, but this terror was nothing compared to the indignation that came over his wife. Where did you cut that nose off, you beast? She shouted wrathfully. Crook! Drunkard! I'll denounce you to the police myself! What a bandit! I've heard from three men already that you pull noses so hard when you give a shave that they barely stay attached. But Ivan Yakovlevich was more dead than alive. He recognized th this nose as belonging to none other than the collegiate assessor Kovalyev, whom he shaved every Wednesday and Sunday. Uh, wait, uh, Preskovia Osipovna, I'll wrap it in a rag and, and put it in the corner. I'll take it out later. I won't hear of it. That I should leave some cut-off nose lying about my room, you dried-up crust. That I should have to answer for you to the police. Oh, you muckworm! Out with it! Out! Take it wherever you like, so that I never hear of it again. Ivan Yakovlevich stood totally crushed. He thought and thought and did not know what to think. Devil knows how it happened. I, whether I came home drunk yesterday or not, I can't say for sure. But by all tokens, this incident should be... Unfeasible, for bread is a, is a baking matter, and a nose is something else entirely. I can't figure it out. Ivan Yakovlevich fell silent. The thought of the police finding the nose at his place and accusing him drove him to complete distraction. He trembled all over. Finally, he took his shirt and boots, pulled all this trash on him, and to the accompaniment of Preskovia Osipovna's weighty admonitions, wrapped the nose in a rag and went out. He wanted to leave it somewhere, in an iron hitching post under a gateway, or just somehow accidentally drop it and turn down an alley. But unfortunately, he kept running into someone he knew, who would begin at once by asking, where are you off to, or who are you going to shave so early, so that Ivan Yakovlevich could never seize the moment. Another time, he had already dropped it entirely, but a policeman pointed to it from afar with his halberd and said, Pick that up, you, you dropped something there. And Ivan Yakovlevich had to pick the nose up and put it in his pocket. Despair came over him, especially as there were more and more people in the street as the stores and shops began to open. He decided to go to St. Isaac's Bridge. Might he not somehow manage to throw it into the Neva? First, he glanced around. Then he leaned over the rail, as if looking under the bridge to see if there were lots of fish darting about, and quietly threw down the rag with the nose. Felt as if a 300-pound weight had suddenly fallen from him. 
Ivan Yakovlevich even grinned. Instead of going to shave the chins of functionaries, he was heading for an institution under the sign that read food and tea to ask for a glass of punch, when suddenly he saw at the end of the bridge a police officer of noble appearance with broad side whiskers and a three-cornered hat wearing a sword. He went dead. And meanwhile, the policeman was beckoning to him with his finger and saying, Come here, my good man. Ivan Yakovlevich, knowing the rules, took off his peaked cap while still far away and approaching rapidly said, Good day to your honor. No, no, brother, never mind my honor. Tell me what you were doing standing on the bridge. Oh, uh, by God, sir, I'm just on my way to give a shave and I, I just stopped to see if the river's flowing fast. Lies, lies, you won't get off with that. Be so good as to answer. I'm ready to shave you twice a week, sir, even three times, with no objections, Ivan Yakovlevich answered. No, friend, that's trifles. I have three barbers to shave me, and they consider it a great honor. Kindly tell me what you were doing there. Ivan Yakovlevich blanched. But here, the incident becomes totally shrouded in mist. And of what happened further, decidedly nothing is known. Part two. The collegiate assessor Kovolev woke up quite early and went Purr! with his lips, something he always did upon waking up, though he himself was unable to explain the reason for it. Kovolev stretched and asked for the little mirror that stood on the table. He wished to look at a pimple that had popped out on his nose the previous evening. But to his greatest amazement, he saw that instead of a nose, he had a perfectly smooth place. Frightened. Kovalev asked for water and wiped his eyes with a towel. Right. No nose. He began feeling with his hand to find out if he might be asleep, but it seemed he was not. The collegiate assessor Kovalev jumped out of bed, shook himself. No nose? He ordered his man to dress him and flew straight to the chief of police. But meanwhile, it is necessary to say something about Kovalev so that the reader may see what sort of collegiate assessor he was. He had held this rank for only two years, and therefore could not forget it for a moment. And to give himself more nobility and weight, he never referred to himself as a collegiate assessor, but always as a major. Listen, dearie, he used to say on meeting a woman selling shirt fronts in the street, come to my place, I live on Saravaya. just ask, where does Major Kovalev live? Anyone will show you. And uh, if he met some comely little thing, he would give her a secret order on top of that, asking, Ask for Major Kovalev's apartment, sweetie. For which reason we shall in future refer to this collegiate assessor as a major. Major Kovalev had the habit of strolling on Nevsky Prospect every day. The collar of his shirt front was always extremely clean and starched. His side whiskers were of the sort. They can still be seen on provincial and regional surveyors, architects, regimental doctors, and generally on all men who have plump, round, ruddy cheeks. These side whiskers go right across the middle of the cheek and straight to the nose. Major Kovalev wore many seals of uh, carnelian with crests and the sort that have uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Monday, and so on, carved on them. Major Kovalev had come to Petersburg on business, namely to seek a post suited to his rank as vice governor, if he was lucky, or else as an executive in some prominent department. Major Kovalev would not have minded getting married, but only on the chance that the bride happened to come with 200,000 in capital. And uh, therefore, the reader may now judge for himself what the state of this major was when he saw, instead of a quite acceptable and moderate nose, a stupid, flat, smooth place. As ill luck would have it, not a single coachman appeared in the street, and he had to go on foot, wrapping himself in his cloak and covering his face with a handkerchief as if it were bleeding. But maybe I just imagined it that way. It's impossible for a nose to vanish so idiotically he thought, and went into a pastry shop on purpose to look at himself in the mirror. Uh, luckily, there was no one in the pastry shop. He timidly approached a mirror and looked. Oh, devil, what nonsense, he said, spitting. There might at least be something instead of a nose, but there's nothing. Biting his lips in vexation, he walked out of the pastry shop and decided, contrary to custom, not to look at anyone or smile to anyone. And suddenly he stopped, as if rooted. 
outside the doors of one house, before his eyes, an inexplicable phenomenon occurred. A carriage stopped at the entrance. The door opened. A gentleman in a uniform jumped out, hunching over, and ran up the stairs. What was Kovalev's horror, as well as amazement, when he recognized him as his own nose? At this extraordinary spectacle, everything seemed to turn upside down in his eyes. He felt barely able to stand, but trembling all over as if in a fever, he decided that whatever the cost, he would await his return to the carriage. Two minutes later, the nose indeed came out. He was in a gold-embroidered uniform with a big standing collar. He had kid-skin trousers on. At his side hung a sword. From his plumed hat, it could be concluded that he belonged to the rank of a state councillor. By all indications, he was going somewhere on a visit. He looked both ways, shouted, Here! to the coachman, got in, and drove off. Poor Kovalev nearly lost his mind. He did not know what to think of such a strange incident. How was it possible, indeed, that the nose, which just yesterday was on his face, unable to drive or walk, should be in a uniform? He ran after the carriage, which luckily had not gone far, and was stopped in front of the Kazan Cathedral. He hastened into the cathedral, made his way through a row of old beggar women with bandaged faces and two openings for the eyes, at whom he had laughed so much before, and went into the church. There were not many people praying in the church. They all stood just by the entrance. Kovalev felt so upset that he had no strength to genuflect, and his eyes kept searching in all the corners for the gentleman. He finally saw him standing to one side. The nose had his face completely hidden in his big standing collar and was praying with an expression of the greatest piety. How shall I approach him, thought Kovalev. By all tokens, by his uniform, by his hat, one can see he's a state councillor. Devil knows how to go about it. He began to <coughs> cough beside him, but the nose would not abandon his pious attitude for a minute and kept bowing down. My dear sir, said Kovalev, inwardly forcing himself to take heart. My dear sir, what can I do for you? The nose said, turning. I, I find it strange, my dear sir. Uh, it seems to me you should know your place. And suddenly I find you, <laughs> where? In, in a church? Uh, you must agree. Excuse me, I, I don't understand what you're talking about. Explain. Please. How should I explain to him? Thought Kovalev, gathering his courage. He began. Well, of course, I... Uh, anyhow, I'm a major. For me to go around without a nose is improper. You must agree. I'm some peddler woman selling peeled oranges on Vorzhezhensky Bridge can sit without a nose, but having prospects in view, being acquainted, moreover, with ladies in many houses, Chektareva, the wife of a state councillor, and others. Well, judge for yourself. I, I don't know, my dear sir. Pardon me, but um, if one looks at it in conformity with rules of duty and honor, you yourself could understand. I understand decidedly nothing, replied the nose. Explain more satisfactorily. My dear sir, Kovalev said with dignity, I don't know how to understand your words. The whole thing seems perfectly obvious. Or do you want to... But you're my own nose. The nose looked at the major and scowled slightly. You are mistaken, my dear sir. I am by myself. Besides, there can be no close relationship between us. Uh, judging by the buttons on your uniform, you must serve in a uh, different department. Having said this, the nose turned away and continued praying. Kovalev was utterly, utterly bewildered, not knowing what to do or even what to think. At that moment, the pleasant rustle of a lady's dress was heard. An elderly lady, all decked out in lace, approached, followed by a slim one in a white dress that very, very prettily outlined her slender waist, wearing a pale yellow hat as light as a pastry. Kovalev stepped closer, straightened the seals hanging on his gold watch chain, and, smiling to all sides, rested his attention on the ethereal lady, who, bending slightly like a flower in spring, 
brought her white little hand with its half-transparent fingers to her brow. The smile on Kovalev's face broadened still more when he saw under her hat a rounded chin of a bright whiteness and part of a cheek glowing with the color of the first spring rose. But he suddenly jumped back as if burnt. He remembered that in place of a nose he had absolutely nothing and tears squeezed themselves from his eyes. He turned with the intention of telling the gentleman in the uniform outright that he was only pretending to be a state councillor, that he was a knave and a scoundrel, and nothing but his own nose. But the nose was no longer there. He had already driven off, again, probably to visit someone. This threw Kovalev into despair. He went back and paused for a moment under the colonnade, looking carefully in all directions in case he might spot the nose. He remembered very well that he was wearing a plumed hat and a gold-embroidered uniform, but he had not noted his overcoat, nor the color of his carriage, nor of his horses. And besides, there were so many carriages racing up and down and at such speed that it was even difficult to notice anything. The day was beautiful and sunny, there were myriads of people on Nevsky, a whole flowery cascade of ladies poured down the sidewalk from the police to the Anichkin Bridge. Oh, there goes an acquaintance of his, a court councillor. <laughs> there's Yarigan, chief clerk of the Senate. Oh, there's another major, waving his arm, inviting him to come over. Oh, the devil take it, said Kovalev. Hey, cabby, drive straight to the chief of police. Gallop the whole way. Is the chief of police in, he cried entering the front hall. Oh, no, he's not, the doorman replied. You just left. Oh, the worst luck. Yeah, the doorman added, not so long ago, but he left. If you'd have come one little minute sooner, you might have found him at home. Kovalev, without taking the handkerchief from his face, got into the cab and shouted in a desperate voice, Drive! Where to? said the cabbie. Straight ahead! Well, how straight ahead? There's a turn here, right or left. This question stopped Kovalev and made him think again. In the end, it seemed that heaven itself gave him an idea. He decided to address himself directly to the newspaper office and hastened to take out an advertisement with a detailed description of his nose's qualities so that anyone meeting him could bring him to him or at least inform him of his whereabouts. And so, having decided on it, he told the cabbie to drive him to the newspaper office. The droshki finally pulled up and Kovalev Breathless, ran into a small reception room where a gray-haired clerk in an old tailcoat and spectacles sat at a table, holding a pen in his teeth and counting the copper money brought to him. Who here takes advertisements? cried Kovalev. Ah, how do you do? Uh, my respects, said the gray-haired clerk, raising his eyes for a moment and lowering them again to the laid-out stacks of coins. I wish to place... Excuse me, one minute, said the clerk, setting down a number on a piece of paper with one hand and with the fingers of his left moving two beads on his abacus. Around them stood a host of old women, shop clerks, and porters, all holding notices. The room into which all this company crowded was small, and the air in it was very heavy. But the collegiate assessor Kovalev could not smell it because he had covered his face with a handkerchief, and because his nose itself was in God knows what parts. My dear sir, uh, allow me to ask, he finally said with impatience, right away, right away, uh, two rubles, 43 kopecks, one minute, one ruble, 64 kopecks, the gray-haired gentleman was saying as he flung the notices into the old women's and porter's faces. Ha! Ah, what can I do for you? He said at last, turning to Kovalev. I ask, uh, said Kovalev, <laughs> some swindling or knavery has occurred. Uh, I, I haven't been able to find out uh, I only ask you to advertise that whoever brings this scoundrel to me will get a sufficient reward. Uh, what is your name, if I may inquire? Oh, no, why the name? Oh, oh no, I can't tell you. Uh, I have many acquaintances. Uh, Czech Dereva, wife of a state councillor. Pelagaya Grigorovna Podolchina, the wife of a staff officer. <laughs> God forbid that they should suddenly find out. Uh, you could simply write uh, a collegiate assessor. Oh, no, uh, better still, one holding the rank of major. And the uh, runaway was your household serf? What household serf? No, that, that would be no great swindle. No, the run that ran away was uh, my nose. Nose? Huh. 
It's a strange name. And did this uh, Mr. Doe's steal a large sum of money from you? Doe's, I said. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, you've got it all wrong. Yeah. My Doe's. My own Doe's. Disappeared on me. I, I, I don't know where. The devils decided to make fun of me. Disappeared in what fashion? I, I'm afraid I, I don't quite understand. I, I really can't say in what fashion, but the main thing is that he's now driving about town calling himself a state councillor. And therefore, I ask you to announce that whoever catches him should immediately present him to me within the shortest time. Maybe consider for yourself how indeed can I do without such a conspicuous part of the body? But it's not like some little toe that I could put in a boot and no one will see it's not there. On Thursdays, I call on the wife of the state councillor, Czech de Reve, Pelagaya Grigorovna Podochina, staff officer's wife. She has a very pretty daughter. They, too, are my good acquaintances. And uh, consider for yourself now. How can I? Just, I can't go to them now. The clerk fell to pondering, as was indicated by his tightly compressed lips. No, I can't place such an announcement in the newspaper, he said, finally, after a long silence. What? Why not? Well, because the, the newspaper may lose its reputation. If everybody starts writing that his nose has run away, well, I mean, people say we publish a lot of absurdities and false rumors as it is. But what's absurd about this matter? It seems to me that it's nothing of the sort. Well, to you it seems so. No, I, I absolutely cannot place such an announcement. But my nose really has vanished. And if so, it's a medical matter. They say there are people who can attach any nose you like. I observe, however, that you, you must be a man of a merry disposition and fond of joking in company. I swear to you, as God is holy... Very well, if it's come to that, I'll show you. Now, why trouble yourself? The clerk went on, taking a pinch of snuff. <sniffs> however, if it's no trouble, he added with a movement of curiosity, it might be desirable to have a look. The collegiate assessor took the handkerchief from his face. Extremely strange indeed, said the clerk. The place is perfectly smooth, like a just-made pancake. Yes, of an unbelievable flatness. Well, are you going to argue now? You can see for yourself that you've got to print it. I'd be especially grateful to you and... I'm very glad that this incident has afforded me the pleasure of making your acquaintance. The Major, as may be seen from that, had decided to fawn a bit this time. Um, of course, printing it is uh, no great matter, said the clerk, only I don't see any profit in it for you. If you really want, you should give it to someone with a skillful pen who can describe it as a rare work of nature and publish the little article in the Northern Bee. Here he took another pinch of snuff for the benefit of the young. Here he wiped his nose, or just for general curiosity. The collegiate assessor was totally discouraged. The clerk himself seemed to be moved by Kovalev's difficult situation. Wishing to soften his grief somehow, he deemed it fitting to express his sympathy in a few words. I'm truly sorry that such an odd thing has happened to you. Would you care for a pinch? It dispels headaches and melancholy states of mind. It's even good for, with regard to hemorrhoids. So saying, the clerk held the snuff box out to Kovalev, quite deftly flipping back the lid. This unintentional act brought Kovalev's patience to an end. I do not understand how you could find it possible to joke, he said in a passion. Can you not see that I precisely lack what's needed for a pinch of snuff? Devil take your snuff! Having said this, he left the newspaper office in deep vexation. He returned home, scarcely feeling his legs under him. It was already dark, dismal or extremely vile his impartment seemed to him after his whole unsuccessful search. Going into the front room, he saw his lackey, Ivan, lying on his back on the soiled leather sofa, spitting at the ceiling and hitting the same spot quite successfully. The man's indifference infuriated him. He gave him a whack on the forehead with his hat, adding, You pig, you're always busy with stupidities. Yvonne suddenly jumped up from his place and rushed to help him off with his cape. Going into his bedroom, the major, weary and woeful, threw himself into an armchair and finally, after several sighs, said, My God, 
My God, why this misfortune? If I lacked an, an arm or a, a leg, it would still be better. If I lacked ears, it would be bad, but still more bearable. But lacking a nose? A man is devil knows what, not a bird, not a citizen. Just take and chuck it out the window. And if it had been cut off in a war or a, a duel, or if I'd caused it myself, but it vanished for no reason. Vanished for nothing. Nothing at all. Oh, no, it can't be, he added after reflecting briefly. <laughs> it's incredible that a nose should just vanish. <laughs> Simply incredible. I must be dreaming or, or just imagining it. Maybe by mistake somehow, instead of water, I drank the vodka that I used to pat my chin after shaving. That fool Ivan didn't take it away and I must have downed it. <laughs> to make absolutely sure that he was not drunk, the Major pinched himself so painfully that he cried out. This pain completely reassured him that he was acting and living in a waking state. He slowly approached the mirror and at first closed his eyes, thinking that the nose might somehow show up where it ought to be. But he jumped back at the same moment, saying, oh, What a lampoonish look! This was indeed incomprehensible. I mean, if it had been a, a button, a silver spoon, a watch, something of that sort that had vanished. But to vanish! And who was it that had vanished? And what's more, in his own apartment, I mean, no one had come into his room, the barber, Ivan Yakovlevich, had shaved him on Wednesday, and the nose had been there the whole of Wednesday, and even all day Thursday. He remembered that, and, and he knew it very well. And besides, he would have felt the pain. The wound, undoubtedly, could not have healed so quickly and become smooth as a pancake. His reflections were interrupted when Ivan appeared, carrying a candle and brightly lighting up the whole bedroom. Kovalev's first impulse was to grab the handkerchief and cover the place where his nose had been just the day before, so that the stupid man would not actually start gaping, when an unfamiliar voice came from the front room, saying, Does the collegiate assessor Kovalev live here? Uh, come in. Major Kovalev is here, said Kovalev, hastily jumping up and opening the door. In came a police officer, of handsome appearance, with quite plump cheeks and side whiskers. The very same one who, at the beginning of this tale, was standing at the end of St. Isaac's Bridge. Did your honor lose his nose? <laughs> right. It has now been found. What's that you say? cried Major Kovalev. Joy robbed him of speech. He stared with both eyes at the policeman standing before him, over whose plump lips and cheeks the tremulous candlelight flickered brightly. How did it happen? And by a strange chance, he was intercepted almost on the road. He was getting into a stagecoach to go to Riga, and he had a passport long since filled out in the name of some official. Strange thing was that I myself first took him for a gentleman. But fortunately, I was wearing my spectacles, and I saw at once that he was a nose. For I'm, I'm nearsighted, and if you're standing right in front of me, I, I can only see that you have a face, but I won't notice any nose or beard. My mother-in-law, my, my wife's mother, she can't see anything either. Kovalev was beside himself. Where is it? Where? I'll run there at once. Oh, don't trouble yourself. Knowing you had need of him, I brought him with me. And it's strange that the chief participant in this affair is that crook of a barber on Vozhnezhenskaya Street, who is now sitting in the police station. Now, I've long suspected him of being a drunkard and a thief. Uh, your nose is exactly as it was. Here, the policeman went to his pocket and took out a nose wrapped in a piece of paper. That's it, cried Kovalev. That's it, all right. Uh, kindly, take a cup of tea with me today. Well, I'd consider it a great pleasure, but I really can't. I must get to the House of Correction. Oh, the prices of all products have gone up so expensively. I've got my mother-in-law, uh, my wife's mother, living with me and the children. For the oldest in particular, we have great hopes. He's a very clever lad, but uh, there's no means at all for his education. Kovalev understood, and snatching a red banknote from the table, put it in the hand of the officer, who 
bowed and scraped his way out, and at almost the same moment, Kovalev heard his voice in the street, where he delivered an admonition into the mug of a stupid moujik who had driven his cart right onto the boulevard. On the policeman's departure, the collegiate assessor remained in some vague state for a few minutes, and only after several minutes acquired the ability to see and feel such obliviousness came over him on account of the unexpected joy. He carefully took the found nose in his two cupped hands and once again studied it attentively. That's it. That's it, all right, Major Kovalev kept repeating. There's the pimple that popped out on the left side yesterday. The Major almost laughed for joy. But nothing in this world lasts long, and therefore joy in the minute that follows the first is less lively. In the third minute, it becomes still weaker, and finally, it merges imperceptibly with one's usual state of mind, as a ring in the water born of a stone's fall finally merges with the smooth surface. Kovalev began to reflect, and realized that the matter was not ended yet. He, the nose had been found, but it still had to be attached, put in its place. And what if it doesn't stick? At this question presented to himself, the Major blanched. With a feeling of inexplicable fear, he rushed to the table and set the mirror before him, so as not to put the nose on somehow askew. His hands were trembling. Carefully and cautiously, he applied it to its former place. Oh, horror. The nose did not stick. He held it to his mouth, warmed it a little with his breath, and again brought it to the smooth place between his two cheeks, but in no way would the nose hold on. Well, so, stay there, you fool, he said to it, but the nose was as if made of wood and kept falling to the table with a strange cork-like sound. The Major's face twisted convulsively. Can it be that it won't grow back on? He repeated in fear, but no matter how many times he put it in its proper place, his efforts remained unsuccessful. He called Ivan and sent him for the doctor, who occupied the best apartment on the first floor of the same building. This doctor was an imposing man, possessed of a handsome pitch-black side whiskers and of a fresh, robust, robust dock dress, ate fresh apples in the morning, and uh, kept his mouth extraordinarily clean by rinsing it every morning for nearly three quarters of an hour and polishing his teeth with five different sorts of brushes. The doctor came that same minute. Having asked him how long ago the misfortune had occurred, he raised Major Kovalev's face by the chin and flicked him with his thumb in the very place where the nose had formerly been, which made the Major throw his head back so hard that he struck the wall behind. The physician said it was nothing, advised him to move away from the wall a bit, told him to tip his head to the right first, and having palpated the spot where the nose had been, said, hmm. Then he told him to tip his head to the left, said, hmm. And in conclusion, flicked him again with his, with his thumb, which made Major Kovalev jerk his head back like a horse having its teeth examined. After performing this test, the physician shook his head and said, No, impossible. Uh, you'd better stay the way you are, because it might come out still worse. Of course, it could be attached. I could perhaps attach it for you now, but I assure you it will be the worse for you. Well, that's just fine. How could I stay without a nose, said Kovalev. It can't be worse than now. This is simply <laughs> the devil knows what. Where can I show myself? I have good acquaintances. Today alone, I have to be at soirees in two houses. I know many people. Chekhtareva, state councillor's wife, Podochida, staff officer's wife. Uh, do be the kindness, Kovalev said in a pleading voice. Isn't there some remedy? Attach it somehow. Maybe not perfectly. So long as it holds, I can even prop it up with my hand on dangerous occasions. Uh, besides, I don't dance. So I can't injure it with some careless movement. <laughs> Regarding my gratitude for your visits, rest assured that everything by beads will permit. Believe me, the doctor said in a voice neither loud nor soft, but extremely affable and magnetic. 
I never treat people for profit. Uh, that is against my rules and my art. True, I take money for visits, but solely so as not to give offense by refusing. Of course, I could attach your nose, but I assure you on my honor, if you do not believe my word, that it would be much worse. You'd better leave it to the effect of nature herself. Wash it frequently with cold water, and I assure you that you'll be as healthy without a nose as with one. As for the nose, I advise you to uh, put it in a jar of alcohol. Uh, better still, add two tablespoons of aquafortis and warm vinegar, and then you'll get decent money for it. I'd even buy it myself if you don't put too high a price on it. No! No, I won't sell it for anything! cried the desperate Major Kovalev. B better let it perish! Excuse me, said the doctor, bowing out. I wish to be of use to you. Nothing to be done. At least you see how I tried. Having said this, the doctor, with a noble bearing, left the room. Meanwhile, rumors of this remarkable incident spread all over the capital, and as usually happens not without special additions. Just then, everyone's mind was precisely attuned to the extraordinary. Only recently, the public had been taken up with experiments in the effects of magnetism. What's more, the story about the dancing chairs on Konyushinaya Street was still fresh, and thus it was no wonder that people soon began saying that the nose of the collegiate assessor Kovalev went strolling on Nevsky Prospect at exactly three o'clock. Hordes of the curious thronged there every day. Someone said the nose was supposed to be in Junker's shop and such a crowd and crushed formed outside Junker's that the police even had to intervene. One speculator of respectable appearance with side whiskers who sold various kinds of cookies at the entrance to the theater had some fine sturdy wooden benches specially made which he invited the curious to stand on for 80 kopecks per visitor. One worthy colonel left home earlier specifically for this and made his way through the crowd with great difficulty, but to his great indignation he saw in the shop window, instead of the nose, an ordinary woolen jacket and a lithograph portraying a girl straightening a stocking and a fop with a turned back waistcoat and a small beard peeping at her from behind a tree, a picture that had been hanging at the same place for over ten years. Then the rumor spread that Major Kovalev's nose went strolling not on Nevsky Prospect, but in the Tavrichesky Garden, and had long been going there. One noble, respectable lady in a special letter asked the overseer of the garden to show this rare phenomenon to her children, and if possible, with an explanation instructive and edifying for the young. All of these events were an extreme joy for those inevitable frequenters of social gatherings who delight in making the ladies laugh and whose stock was by then completely exhausted. A small portion of respectable and right-minded people were extremely displeased. One gentleman said with indignation that he did not understand how such preposterous inventions could be spread in our enlightened age, and that he was astonished that the government paid no attention to it. Uh, this gentleman was obviously one of those gentlemen who wished to mix the government into everything, even their daily quarrels with their wives. After that, ah, but here again, the whole incident is shrouded in mist, and what came later is decidedly unknown. Part three. Perfect nonsense goes on in this world. Sometimes there's no plausibility at all. Suddenly, as if nothing was wrong, that same nose which had driven about in the rank of state councillor and made such a stir in town was back in place, that is, precisely between the two cheeks of Major Kovalev. This happened on the 7th of April. Waking up and chancing to look in the mirror, he saw the nose. He grabbed it with his hand. Yes, the nose. Ah, ha! said Kovalev, and in his joy he nearly burst into a jig all around the room, but Ivan hindered him by coming in. He ordered a wash at once, and as he was washing again, glanced in the mirror. The nose! Drying himself with a towel, he again glanced in the mirror. The nose! Look, Ivan, I think I've got a pimple on my nose, he said, and thought, meanwhile, what a disaster if Ivan says no, sir, not only no pimple, but no nose either. But Ivan said, no, nothing, sir, no pimple at all. The nose is clean. Good! Devil take it, the major said to himself and snapped his fingers. At that moment, the barber, Ivan Yakovlevich, 
peeked in the door, but as timorously as a cat that has been beaten for stealing lard. Uh, tell me first, are your hands clean? Kovalev cried to him from afar. Yes. Lies? By God, they're clean, sir. Well, watch yourself now. Kovalev sat down. Ivan Yakovlevich covered him with a towel and, in an instant, with the aid of a brush, transformed his whole chin and part of his cheeks into a lather. Look at that, Ivan Yakovlevich said to himself, glancing at the nose. Then he tipped the head the other way and looked at it from the side. There now, really. Just think of it, he continued and went on looking at the nose for a long time. At last, lightly, as cautiously as one could imagine, he raised two fingers so as to grasp the tip of it. Such was Ivan Yakovlevich's system. Ah, uh, ah, uh, watch out, cried Kovalev. Ivan Yakovlevich dropped his arms, more confused and taken aback than he'd ever been before. Finally, he started tickling carefully under his chin with the razor, and though it was quite difficult and inconvenient for him to give a shave without holding on to the smelling part of the body, nevertheless, resting his rough thumb on the cheek and lower jaw, he finally overcame all obstacles and shaved him. When everything was ready, Kovalev hastened at once to get dressed, hired a cab, and drove straight to the pastry shop. Going in, he cried from afar, a cup of hot chocolate, boy, and instantly went up to the mirror. The nose was there. He gaily turned around and with a satirical air, squinting one eye a little, looked at two military men, one of whom had a nose no bigger than a waistcoat button. After that, he went to the office of the department where he had solicited a post as vice governor, or failing that as an executive. Passing through the waiting room, he looked in the mirror. The nose was there. On his way out, he met Podochina, the staff officer's wife, with her daughter, greeted them, and was met with joyful exclamations. <sighs> Nothing, then. He was in no way damaged. He talked with them for a very long time, and purposely, taking out his snuff box, spent a very long time in front of them, filling his nose from both entrances, murmuring to himself, Ah, there, that's for you, females, <laughs> hen folk. And even so, I won't marry the daughter. Uh, just like that, par amour, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> and Major Kovalev strolled on thereafter as if nothing was wrong, on Nevsky Prospect and in the theaters and everywhere. And the nose also sat on his face as if nothing was wrong, not even showing a sign that it had ever gone anywhere. And after that, Major Kovalev was seen eternally in a good humor, smiling, chasing after decidedly all the pretty ladies, and even stopping once in front of a shop in the Merchant's Arcade to buy some ribbon or other. No one knows for what reason, since he was not himself the bearer of any decoration. Such was the story that occurred in the northern capital of our vast country. Only now, on overall reflection, we can see that there is much of the implausible in it. Um, to say nothing of the strangeness of the supernatural detachment of the nose and its appearance in various places in the guise of a state councillor, how was it that Kovalev did not realize that he ought not to make an announcement about the nose through the newspaper office? It's indecent, inept, injudicious. And then, too, how did the nose end up in the baked bread? And how did Ivan Yakovlevich himself... <laughs> no, that I just do not understand. I decidedly do not understand. But... What is strangest, what is the most incomprehensible of all, is how authors can choose such subjects. And I confess, that is utterly inconceivable. It's, it's simply... Duh. No, no, I utterly fail to understand. In the first place, there is decidedly no benefit to the fatherland. And in the second place, in the second place, there's also no benefit. I, I simply do not know what it... Mm. And yet, for all that, though it is certainly possible to allow for, for one thing and another, and a third, perhaps, even, and then, too, are there not incongruities everywhere? And yet, once you reflect on it, there really is something to all this. I mean, say what you like, but such incidents do happen in the world. Rarely, but they do happen. 
the end. <laughs>